Um, but I, um, I want to say that I, I'm actually not introducing the next speaker. I'm introducing the person who's introducing the next speaker. And the gentleman who is introducing our next speaker is a self-described armchair behavioral scientist, as well as a contributing editor and writer for Skeptical Inquiry. So please welcome Stuart Buzz. Hi. Um, you weren't expecting to see me, probably. Um, but I'm happy to be here, uh, as always. Um, this is a very special talk, and that's why I asked to, I elbowed my way in here. Um, uh, in a recent issue of Skeptical Inquirer, which of course you all subscribe to, I hope, um, uh, Scott Lilienfeld wrote an wrote a article about the power of conversion stories. You know, religious people have had these stories of, you know, I was lost and now I'm found, and you know, all of that sort of thing. And uh, so do recovery communities have stories that they tell over and over again about how they converted from the, the, the wrong path to the right one. And even we, in this group, have a number of very important conversion stories, like uh, Britt Marie Hermes, who's going to be speaking this weekend, is in a sense a, a come, come from one side to the right side. And uh, Susan Blackmore, some of you may know, also in a sense is a conversion story. And these are powerful stories. Janice Boynton, who is going to speak, has such a story. Also, I'm not going to tell it right now. And she is not going to tell it, I don't think, either. She was a believer in facilitated communication and changed into a skeptic and, and a very important one. Uh, but I, she w was kind enough to let me tell that story in uh, an article that I wrote for Skeptical Inquirer. So I urge you, if you have a chance, to look for an article online on the Skeptical Inquirer website called An Artist with a Science-Based Mission, and it's, it's a very moving and important story. Um, she also is, is quietly the leader of a group of people who are trying to stamp out facilitated communication. Uh, a group of psychologists, uh, special educators, speech pathologists, and I am honored to count myself among her group. Uh, also, uh, within our, our organization, uh, Craig Foster, who I think may be here somewhere, it, there he is, uh, is a member of this, this little quiet group, and Scott Lilienfeld himself is a very important member of it. So, so she has done a lot to not just say, you know, become a, uh, a skeptic with respect to this, but to become a real activist. Uh, doing important work to to uh, try to right this wrong, and so she's here now. It's at SciCon, and I don't know when she found out about it. By the way, I should also mention that Susan Gerbic is a member of her group as well, simply because there isn't anything skeptical that Susan Gerbic isn't involved in. <laughs> but but um, <laughs> yes, uh, but. But uh, Janice is here at SciCon, and, it, and I'm very happy that she is because I don't know when she found out about this organization and, and this movement, but she is very much someone that should be a part of this group. Uh, her, her cause is definitely our cause, and so I want you to help me make her feel very welcome here at SciCon. Thank you. here today um, to talk to you about facilitated communication. For those of you who don't know, it's a, a communication technique technique that um, is being used with people with profound um, communication difficulties. So they have difficulty comprehending um, spoken and written and reading language and yet miraculously through facilitated communication they're able to um, type out whole sentences, and I will get into that. I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, it's interesting, the, the, um, the question has always been with facilitated communication, who's doing the pointing? And um, based on my experiences, um, both as a facilitator and going through double-blind testing, 
Um, I've learned a few things about that, and also I've been talking to researchers all over the world who have continued to um, help me also understand um, part of what happened to my story and why. And, and I, I'm not going to tell my whole story today, but I will be available at the GSOW um, table um, later, and I'm willing to talk to people in more in depth. But I wanted to give everybody kind of an overview of facilitated communication. Now, the, the um, proponents, instead of answering the question, who's doing the pointing, they have chosen facilitated communication. Has, it's been around for about 30 years in the United States. It's taken on a really bad um, reputation, so they've just simply changed the name to supported typing and typing to communicate. Um, so you may also know I see from that. Um, now, I'm going to show you an example in just a second of facilitated communication, just so everybody's clear about what it is. And what I would like you to do, a lot of people um, focus on the person with disabilities when they see videos of facilitated communication, but I'd like you to look primarily at um, the facilitator and um, the key to knowing whether somebody is facilitating or not the, the, um, or influencing the communication is by looking at the facilitator behavior. Um, so vocal inflections, um, proximity to the client, um, movements of their fingers, and how absorbed the facilitator is in the um, communication. <laughs> Hi. You know, well, he never looks at the board. And I'm Peter Rowe, and we are using She's not influencing Communication. The other thing is, listen how hard he's tapping it and how quickly mm -hmm. he's typing on that board. I don't know if the facilitator could actually, if, even if they weren't um, influencing the communication, I don't know how you can process information that fast, like which letters are being typed on that or touched on that board. Um, so communication, facilitated communication was introduced to the United States in 1990 by Douglas Spicklin um, in an article called Communication Unbound, and it captured the imaginations of people all over the country. It was at the beginning of the inclusion movement, and people just, it spread like wildfire because it was an easy solution to a difficult communication problem. So simply by um, supporting somebody emotionally and physically, they, all of a sudden, you've got um, access to hidden knowledge or, or previously silent people could communicate um, independently. And um, note the independence view, or read a lot of the pro-FC literature, independence means physically cueing or, or, or auditory or visually cueing the person. So that's independent, according to facilitators. Um, Again, to, to make FC work, um, require, it, it's a facilitator influence technique, so it re actually requires verbal, auditory, and physical cueing to work. And it's become very sophisticated. There have been people who have um, pairs, facilitator um, client pairs, have been facilitating for 20 or 30 years, and, and the, um, they can stand, the, the facilitator can stand across the room, but is still cueing the person over here who's doing the typing. So it can be very sophisticated. Um, unexpected literacy, that was one of the cues that, um, that for critics was that um, all of a sudden people who could not spell their name out or, um, um, or type a cohesive sentence could all could write poetry. They're they're actually going to college now using facilitated communication. In fact, um, Syracuse University on um, Monday and Tuesday is hoping is holding yet another um, workshop on facilitated communication. There, the Syracuse is the reason why FC exists in the United States. So, facilitated dependence is not independence. That's the point that I would make to point out there. So double blind, te double blind testing primarily um, happened. Um, I was involved with a um, false allegation of abuse case, so I was required, or not required, but it made sense for me to um, go through double blind testing. Um, and the facilitated messages were actually mine and not the, the client. 
Um, many, many um, blind tests have happened since then. So the facilitator may be shown a picture and the, the um, person with disabilities may be shown a picture. They're, they don't know what each other is seeing. And when the facilitator doesn't have access to test protocols ahead of time, um, which is how proponents prove FC works, is they include the facilitator um, during the, de the development of double-blind testing, so they know the answers ahead of time. But if they don't, um, then time and time and time and time and time again, it's the facilitator, and it doesn't matter the content. Um, most and most of the testing is not done with serious content. Um, it's just people really wanting to know who's doing the pointing. The duration of training also does not affect the uh, person's susceptibility. So I looked at all the, um, the controlled um, testing from starting from around 92 to the present. And um, kind of, I'm, because I was a former facilitator, I'm also interest, really interested in the facilitator perspective. Looked at the facilitators and it didn't matter whether they took a one or two day workshop. Um, or um, if they had been trained directly by Douglas Bicklin and his group and, and had been facilitating for, for years, um, they're, they're still equally susceptible to facilitator influence. It's built into the technique. It makes sense to me now, it didn't then, but um, it just, it, it's one of those things that it, the evidence is just so clear um, what's happening here. Um, but proponents reject the testing. So um, they, what they do is they look at the written word and they, they um, find unique spellings or um, unique turns of phrase and they say, see, the facilitator didn't know, they wouldn't have written that, so it must be true. So their, their rationale for why FC works is prim runs primarily along the lines with um, people using FC say it works, so it must work. Um, I'm going to show you another example. Um, it's morphed into um, a couple different versions. This is rapid prompting method. And people sometimes confuse this because the facilitator holds a board in front of the person. Um, could be an iPad or a letter, you know, a, a communication device. But um, in this example is a board and the person with disabilities is pointing to it um, technically independently. But if you watch the facilitator, you'll see that she's moving the board, there's also um, verbal infl uh, vocal inflection, she starts and stops the conversation in some senses, um, also known as um, spelling to communicate, letter boarding and informative typing, They've changed, uh, may, there may be new ones um, uh, since they've even written this out, so um, uh, I just want to see. Oh, and also what's disturbing to me about this particular clip is the client's vocalizations and nonverbal communication are largely ignored and they, they just focus, um, uh, facilitators focus mostly on the written, the typed um, words. So the client, there's examples, um, not in this one, but there's examples where the client is saying yes to some or no to something, no I don't like blueberry pie or whatever can actually verbalize that, but the, the type message is, yes, I like um, blueberry pie, so guess what they get for dessert? They get blueberry pie. Um. I am in A space C O is also a um, and is right. is eyes, so watch for that. S T space I'm in a constant. So I'm in a constant. Continuing to point. B A T T. And all those cues she's given to him are 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 T -T to interact with the board, and there's no L. Point. Unless we did double e line testing with his pair. He got it. We're gonna walk it again. Wow. Um, what I, what I want to 
emphasize here that FC is being used to make major life decisions, um, housing, medical, health questions um, of relationship issues, including marriage and sexual relationship. I, I wouldn't want to be the facilitator in that situation. <laughs> Um, the, um, we also know that, um, that like, as in, in my case, seriously, um, uh, there was a suspected abuse um, by the, the facilitator, and so they're reporting um, sexual abuse um, cases to the authorities, um, and that um, includes the Department of Justice has a brochure that allows facilitated communication as part of those interviews, um, and we know from experience that um, it's the facilitator, um, one, it's the facilitator um, writing the messages to FC, and two, it does not, um, the protocols that are set in place, the guidelines to supposedly protect from false allegations to be made, um, doesn't protect people from false and being accused of crimes. So um, that's one of the projects that I would like to um, see moving forward is um, working on getting those um, there are um, 20 plus major organizations, I'll show you a list in just a minute, um, that have, um, they've, they've done their own research into facilitated communication and they have um, policies opposing FC and rapid prompting method, any of the, the facilitator influenced um, techniques. And the reasons they um, cite are um, facilitator authorship is a question. It limits access to valid, augmentative, and alternative communication, um, which allow people to truly independently um, communicate and, and have um, interactions with communication devices. Um, inhibits individual rights to communicate independently, and again, false allegations of abuse and facilitator crimes. So recently, um, within the last, I'd say, five years, we're starting to see the facilitators believe in FC so much that, and sometimes they fall in love with the person that they are um, working with, with disabilities, so they're gaining. Um, there are two cases that I know about that people have been um, uh, convicted of um, sexual um, assault on their client because they used um, FC for um, consent, sexual consent, only FC. That's, that was the only um, tool that they used. Um, we also know of one unfortunate um, young boy who was killed by his parent, his mom because she was using facilitated communication with him, felt that he might have been sexually um, assaulted and that he wanted, and through FC, typed out messages that he wanted to die. So she fed him um, pills and gave him an overdose of pills um, and he ended up dying. So if this, is, this goes from, you know, Parents using using FC on a low key basis to very very serious um, crimes here. Um, these are some, just some of the organizations. I'm not gonna. I, I can send people if you if you contact me later and would like a list. I can actually send you a list of organizations and, and references and stuff um, that back up the claims in this talk. But um, associations like American Speech Language Hearing Association, a lot of behavior analysis. So Associations, International Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. Mm -hmm. List goes on. Um, I'd like to point out the Lakes Region Community College is one of the few colleges in the country who have a policy opposing FC. Mm -hmm. They um, allow people with and, and encourage people with disabilities um, who require uh, valid augmentative uh, and communication devices to do their coursework, but with FC in particular. They can't tell who's doing the coursework, the facilitator, or the person with disability. So they said, you know, um, they're one of the few that have actually had that policy in place. And there are people graduating Oberlin College this month where they've allowed people to go through their programs um, using facilitated communication and graduating with degrees. Um, so along with um, universities and institutes, uh, colleges, um, there are uh, groups that have formed to, to practice facilitated communication and, and I say evangelize its use. Um, a lot of the um, messages that come out through um, these groups um, kind of work around freedom of speech, disability rights, 
including confidence, which are all very valid and should be discussed when you're talking about people with disabilities. But they don't answer the question of who is doing the pointing, who's authoring those, those pages. Groups also provide financial support to institutes who promote FC, both by going through their, uh, by donating private donations, going through their workshops, like the one that's going to be held in Syracuse, and um, um, also go, actually taking the classes as facilitator um, student pair. So this is one of the groups. <laughs> Thank you. 
his hands across the keyboard. The other disturbing thing is this is really difficult 
<laughs> and it seemed very similar. You know, any, any movie you've seen featuring your major board, Exorcist, Paranormal Activity, The Conjuring, like, ah, nah, I'm going to call it bullshit. Um, but I will say, I'll be honest and transparent and say that I saw a form of facilitated communication at home. Um, my mom would speak for my dad all the time. <laughs> he didn't even have to be in the room. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys, please, another round of applause for, for Janice.